Look at this line. This line represents a nightmare for anyone living in a world where line goes down means bad. This is the graph for Imperator Rome, Paradox Interactive's massive strategy investment released in 2019. Now, the announcement was hype, not gonna lie, but the numbers also don't lie. A drop from roughly 42,000 players on launch day, only to stoop to one third of that not a week later. And it gets worse. But why did this happen? Bad UI design, unclear mechanics, and buggy gameplay, Imperator Rome symbolizes everything wrong with shipping a game early and counting on your players to be there while it get patched up over the course of years. So why do I still love Imperator so much? Why do I think it might be the best Paradox game ever made when divided by post-launch content? I'll cut right to the chase. I've become addicted to Imperator Rome recently, particularly when playing with the Terra Indomita mod, which literally adds all of Asia, including China and Japan, to the game. And I want to share exactly why. Why this game is so awesome, and why you need to check it out if you haven't already. Because the features I am about to show you can't really be found anywhere else in the same way, and certainly not in the context of the ancient world. And if you like what you're hearing so far, then please consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel. I'd really appreciate it. So let's go, baby! Feature number one, humanity itself. Now this might sound strange, but have you ever wanted to play Crusader Kings but with better state mechanics? Or have you played EU4 but craved more personality in your characters rather than them just being names in a menu? Or perhaps you've played Victoria and want that same depth in political navigation and all of it taking place in antiquity? You are in luck, my friend, because this is exactly what Imperator Rome offers. A world filled with intricate state management that sometimes go beyond EU4-like depth, but also providing actual faces and personalities to names and titles, creating an entire world of people that makes this game feel that much deeper. And if you now think, well, well that has to be too good to be true, Imperator probably sucks at both, rather than doing either one of them well, well I got news for you. No, it don't. As it stands, Imperator actually does state management just as good if not better than other Paradox games, and it does characters better than most too. The only caveat as I see it is that it can be complicated to get into at first, and depending on who you're playing as. Thing is, like in EU4, you are always in charge of your state no matter what. You control it as far as you're able, depending on various interests, population happiness, laws, and technology, but you're also taking the role of your faction leader. But this has massive implications. For the more traditional experience, we have kingdoms like Macedon, one of the most powerful Hellenistic successor states. Macedon is a state ruled by one individual in a hereditary system, and technology notwithstanding, you can change country laws whenever you wish. No matter the person in the game, every character has their own personality and traits, meaning they're better or worse at various parts of state, like warfare or ruling, and can begin with or attain new traits that impact how suited they are for different tasks. As a king, it's your job to make sure your children inherit the throne and survive the next generation, because every other character in your realm have different levels of loyalty, including possible other heirs. You can use your personal powers to increase your standing, arrange marriages, banish or execute your enemies, and so much more. Civil wars and succession crises might occur if you have pretenders, and just like if you lose your state to a foreign invader, losing a civil war against your dynasty will mean that you lose the game, kinda like CK2 in a way. You may use your royal powers to influence the state directly or summon your war council to rally support around where to campaign next. In other words, as long as you keep your legitimacy and loyalties high, you can pretty much do whatever you want. But it also means that family is just as important as the maintenance of the state. At the same time, we have other government systems in Imperator, but one where the characters are equally if not more important, namely republics. Republics are a totally different matter in terms of management. We have a senate now, and every character supports one of three parties in the senate. Your campaign, while still tied to survival of the state from enemies both foreign and domestic, are not tied to individual leaders or families anymore. We have elections now, and whoever is elected consul or leader will act as your character, the person you interact as. It does sound strange at first, doesn't it? But it really does work. It is only the leader you personally control, only through the leader that you can do things like sponsor games, increase your popularity or state power, befriend other characters, order assassinations, send disloyal characters to trial for treason, increase or decrease the popularity of yourself and others, make use of actions that will change the party loyalty of other characters, and so on. And while republics are a lot more flexible in this way, in that you don't lose the game when another character from another family is made ruler, it can also make it a lot more or less interesting depending on your playstyle. 
Making use of personal actions like friendships must be done fast, since you're likely to only control this character for a few years. While a king has all the time in the world to create lasting bonds of either friendships or rivalries. Furthermore, depending on your council's party affiliation and the senate party makeup, certain laws will be on or off the table. While senate approval, which determines which diplomatic and legal actions you can take, will wax and wane depending on who's in charge and how the last election went. In the law section, you can even decrease or extend term limits if you want a bit more of that longevity to your rulers. And you can even appoint your ruler as dictator during wartime, if you want them to stay just a bit longer and avoid the possible turmoil of an election during wartime. In other words, while Imperator is not nearly as purely character-focused as Crusader Kings, it does add a ton of personality and gameplay to a deep state system. In essence, making for a much more personal experience that sees you relate to and manage characters, while also running the massive behemoth that is your state. And I love that so much. And speaking of behemoths, feature number two, actual amazing empire development. If you're watching this video, chances are you've played CK2 or CK3 or EU4. And if you have, you know that both of these games use various metrics for determining the development of a city or a province. Both CK3 and EU4 make use of a literal mechanic called development, a level-based system that increases passively over time or with certain actions, but which can be tinkered with to nudge it either way up or down. But I want to introduce you to something a lot cooler, namely Imperator Rome's Populations, or POPs for short. First of all, you see this map? This is huge compared to either of the games that came before it. But let's zoom down a bit. See that? The map is divided into larger provinces, but within those provinces are even smaller sectors, namely towns and cities. This is where our people live, actual people mind you, the ones making up our entire empire. They're not just named a vague population name either, but are actually divided into various classes, like nobles, citizens, freemen, tribesmen, and slaves. Each of these classes of people play their own role in society, as in making up your armies, your economic base, and contribute to your technological research and level of civilization, i.e. how developed your empire is. Now this might not seem so scary if you're playing as the tiny city-state of Athens, and you're in charge of perhaps a few dozen pops in the beginning. But what if you're taking on the role of a Rome that's eyeing European domination, and suddenly you are leading the world's single largest empire in terms of population, with over 6,000 different pops? And what if pops weren't just divided into classes, but each member swears to their own religion and culture? Do you see how deep this goes? Not only that, but each city tile in the world is as large as its current development entails, meaning in terms of buildings available and the max number of buildings buildable, they can only support as many as either the city status or depending on your infrastructure investment. In other words, whereas in CK3, where you're basically stuck with your counties only ever allowing you to raise at most a handful of buildings, Imperator Rome allows you to increase that number many times over, essentially as many times as your own resources allow for. But you know, it doesn't end there. Because not only can pops move organically between classes and what's known as promotion and demotion, simulating how slaves were freed or how freemen earned their citizenship, but pops can migrate. And importantly, you can do what the Romans did historically and treat pops of various cultures differently. Divide and conquer, if you will. Depending on what you want to do, meaning assimilate, integrate, or simply coexist, you can give the different cultures in your empire various rights and privileges, which will have the repercussions for their happiness and ability to partake in your society. I mean, this sounds insane, right? That's because it is. It really is insanely cool. But the last aspect of this entire system is a no-brainer. Every nation is different. But that statement has massive implications. For you see, while Rome is mostly made up of Romans in the early game, or at least cultures within its culture group, the massive Seleucid Empire is perhaps the most multicultural state in the game. And importantly, your primary culture, namely Macedonian, is in the small minority, meaning you're going to fight a massive uphill battle in terms of eternal peace and stability. In other words, this means that Imperator Rome, more than most games out there, manages to portray deeper conflicts of the various ancient empires, but also allows you to change the course of history in awesomely deep ways that truly feels addicting when you get the hang of it. And in my opinion, the empire development systems and their consequences is perhaps the best feature of the entire game. That was number two. Feature number three, in some ways closely linked to feature number two, warfare and army management. For you see, depending on your empire's laws, your culture, and population, your system of warfare and way of fighting will radically change. You might think that raising an army is only about clicking buttons to recruit new units, but that is so far from the truth. 
For you see, Imperator Rome actually likes to have fun with its military doctrines, to a point where no other pre-modern game compares. Because here, the most important factor in what your army looks like is not first and foremost determined by your barracks level, but by your country's laws. Every country has a range of laws covering various parts of society, and military is one of them. What's interesting is that these laws will change depending on your empire and your culture group, tailoring the circumstances to your needs. And unlike most laws, the next military law is almost always better than the former, unless you intend to play in unique ways for the immersion. For you see, the basic military reforms in the game only allow you to raise levies, soldiers which are drafted for specific purposes when you need them the most, which will have to be disbanded when you no longer need them. And the reason for this is simple. Every soldier in the game is tied to our lovely population system, meaning that as long as your levy is raised, you're missing out on valuable economic growth, because those soldiers actually used to be farmers and workers. Indeed, since levies are drafted from individual provinces, they will also be led by governor generals, giving possible disloyal politicians a lot of power that could be turned against you, because these soldiers can actually become personally loyal to their generals. In other words, the longer your levies are raised, the worse it gets. This is the case for states like Rome in the early game, and it's only through technological advancements and future law changes, with the Senate's approval, that you might institute the Marian and later reforms that will truly professionalize your army. Indeed, doing so will lend you the ability to establish your first legion, a true standing army that does not cripple your economic growth and is controlled by generals of your choosing, not by governors. This changes the entire way you fight wars, since suddenly, you don't have to scramble to raise levies if you're not backed up against the wall. And importantly, you now also get to decide the makeup of your army, choosing yourself, depending on your faction's strengths and weaknesses, how many heavy soldiers, light infantry, cavalry, archers and so on your legion will consist of. The size of a legion is further determined by its raising and upkeep costs, plus the population in its founding region. So to some extent, each legion's power still depends on your provinces. The legion is more powerful and interesting than just being more independent though. Because the legion, unlike most armies in Paradox games, can actually attain distinctions and traditions. These traditions follow the legion wherever it goes, and are always attained through battle or sieges. For example, my Legio Italia has gained a total of 5 different traditions unique to this one army, giving it bonuses while fighting in various terrains and making it better at sieging enemy cities, amongst other things. And look, it even has a dedicated history page, detailing every notable action the Legion has undertaken since its founding. Furthermore, other than doing the fighting of course, Legions have several abilities that have real campaign impact. Legions can lay down roads, which not only allows them to move much faster across the empire, but also improves the local trade in the cities where roads are built. Legions can build border forts by spending manpower instead of gold, allowing you to fortify regions in need of defenses and at a lower upkeep cost. Legions can train, giving you valuable army experience, and legions can even reorganize in real time, sacrificing movement speed and upkeep for faster man and morale replenishment. And with the right tech, you can even order forced march, sacrificing recovery for movement speed. That's it for legions, but there are other ways to wage your wars than through levies or legions actually. In the mod Terra Indomita for example, Carthage has access to a military law that gives you massive discounts when using mercenaries. You see, depending on where you're located in the world, mercenary armies will be available for hire. By default, they are quite expensive, meaning you're likely to be better off with your own standing army. But with this law of Carthage, you can avoid raising your own levies, avoid paying for your own legions, and make use of mercenaries when you need them more reliably and cheaper, emulating what Carthage did historically actually. This is nothing but completely awesome, and I love the range Imperator allows for here, even when it comes to the very nature, not just the unit makeup, of your armies. And of course, because of Imperator Rome's attention to detail, you actually need to transport your armies on navies if you want to take them overseas, and your navy needs to be above the appropriate size to do so. It's a feature more and more strategy games seem to be leaving behind, but which I find crucial when it comes to immersion and warfare strategy, as this makes navies so important for overseas wars and island nations, adding another layer of strategy to the game. I mean, imagine actually reforging the Athenian Empire and its powerful navy? You can do that here, and it'll be even more fun with Imperator's pop and development system, which allows you to play out those tall fantasies in full. Feature number 4 is one I very much appreciate, namely diplomatic stances. Diplomacy often works relatively similarly in Paradox's grand strategy games, and they often work in the same general way. 
Imperator 2 allows you to increase or otherwise influence your relations with other states in various ways, but one thing I find so fun about Imperator system are the diplomatic stances. This is a system where you project a certain image of your state outwardly, but the stance you choose has massive repercussions both inside and outside your empire. For example, say you're on the warpath. You might want to choose the bellicose stance, which admittedly lowers other states' opinion of you, but does lower your future aggressive expansion, lowers war score costs, and increases the speed at which you fabricate claims. This can make expansion a lot easier to deal with. But if you have the political power, you can change the stance, and if you wish to create alliances and bind subject states to you, you might want to consider the appeasing stance, which raises foreigners' opinion of you, lowers the cost of improving relations, and lowers your aggressive expansion faster over time. Another useful stance for an economic hegemon is the mercantile stance, which, by telling your neighbors that you are interested in trade, massively raises their opinion of you, while also increasing your commerce income by a large 25%. There are other stances here as well, each one suited for various situations, but I love this feature so much because I feel like it puts into system the idea of wishing to project a certain image of your state abroad. For the fifth major feature I wanted to tell you about today, and it's one you'll get from the incredible mod Terra Indomita, which itself is based on the amazing work of the mods Imperator Invictus and full mechanical overhaul, is subject interactions. No matter the paradox game, I love my subjects. As for some reason, having vassal states just feels right, you know? It lends more diplomacy and strategy to the experience of being a hegemon. But what vanilla Imperator lacks is subject flavor, and luckily, that's something these mods fix. As long as you have subjects, you can now interact with them, spending various resources to either make them like you more, or funnel wealth or power into your own kingdom. This lends so much more roleplay and fun to vassal playthroughs or just to the concept of having subject states, meaning diplomacy isn't over even if you manage to vassalize a state or ten. And lastly, but absolutely not least, the sixth major feature I want to tell you about today is the fact that the mod Terra Indomita flawlessly creates an ancient world that stretches all the way from Portugal and Ireland in the west to Japan in the east, which is so much larger than the vanilla game which ends at India's eastern border. This makes Imperator Rome a truly massive world, offering a campaign like no other, with tens of thousands of cities across the world, each with their own populations, buildings, cultures, religions, and other modifiers. We also have a modified timeline here, meaning you can play for as long as you want. So imagine those campaigns where a western power meets China or anyone else from the Far East, just absolute epic madness incarnate, especially in multiplayer, holy shit. There is a lot more to Imperator Rome than the features mentioned in this video suggest, but I really want to share my love for this game, as I believe it is criminally underrated and deserving of a lot more love, especially with Terra Indomita. And of course, if you want to play Imperator Rome with mods, it's literally a one-click process of installing them from the workshop. Enter Indomita, Invictus, or full mechanical overhaul mod, or even Lord of the Rings is right there, opening a whole new world of possibilities. I love Imperator Rome and can't get enough, but let me know what you think of Imperator's features and this video in the comments, and don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers!